Thanks, Paul. So um, I work at uh, IBM Albany Research Center and uh, just realized we are also hiring. So uh, if you're interested, um, the people we're looking for are in uh, text mining, um, data mining, um, looking for people who are interested in services research, which is the area I work with, which is looking at uh, applying these problems to real customer engagements, um, looking for ways to improve uh, service efficiency. Um, Almaden is a great place to work. Uh, we were over located down near Bernal, out in the park. Um, I remember 14 years ago when I first interviewed there, I think more than the job they offered, I fell in love with the building. It was just um, an incredible place. Um, it was built in the early 70s, and it's uh, just uh, everyone there has their own office with a view <laughs> and uh, just really nice kind of atmosphere. And it's a great place in terms of the people who work there. We have physicists, we have material scientists, mathematicians, computer scientists, service researchers, um, ethnographers, uh, just an incredible mixture of talent in all different areas of expertise. So it's a constant place where you can get exposed to new ideas, new ways of thinking, new areas. So with that plug, I'll, I'll move on to my talk. Um, as I was putting this talk together a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in my office, um, door open, and Steve Boyer wanders into my office, starts looking over my shoulder. He does this all the time. Steve Boyer, you probably don't know him, but he's a kind of our group salesman. He's, he's the guy who goes out to our customers and shows them our great technology and just puts on a wonderful show. I wish he were here today, but uh, you would really be impressed if he was. He, he can really do a song and dance that'll, that'll knock your socks off. So anyway, he looks over my shoulder and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm putting together this talk that kind of explains the work I've been doing for the last 10 years and you know, kind of makes a really good story about the whole thing in one, one, one hour presentation. Next time I says, that is the most boring presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> are you sure you want to give that? <laughs> so, um, you know, it doesn't have quite the impact that most of Steve's talks do. If he were up here, he'd be showing you whiz-bang graphics and all sorts of pretty pictures and stuff. My slides are not like that. Um, I want to intervene here. <laughs> I have seen two or three talks from the group that Scott is in, or I selected Scott, <laughs> because they t everybody told me he's the most uh, technically inclined of the <laughs> well, let's hope so. I hope you find something of use in here. Um, I was going to say that while Steve's talk may be flashier, if you ask him some, some questions, he may give you answers that make sense to him, but I'm not sure they're actually reality, so um, keep that in mind. I think everything I'll tell you here is definitely grounded in reality. And uh, Paul interrupted me just now. That's great. If you guys have comments, questions, thoughts you want to interpose, I love that. Uh, most of the talks we give at Almond are extremely interactive. People are not afraid to jump up and tell, tell you what they think, even if it totally disagrees with what you're saying. So don't, don't hesitate. Oh, I've got this little thing I need to start using. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit instead of talking about uh, sensing the information space, I'm actually going to talk a little bit first about what I call exploratory analytics. Um, it's really kind of what I realized that I do now. <laughs> I didn't start out knowing I was going to do exploratory analytics for a living 10 years ago, but it turns out that's what I do. And I think it's a little different than maybe your typical data mining approach. And so I want to um, try to give you a flavor for what that means. And in doing so, I'm going to describe what I call a practice of exploratory analytics um, and really go over kind of a, a broad view of 10 years of work in this area and how it's impacted IBM. Um, and then I'll start talking about this idea of a process. Um, how do you actually do exploratory analytics in practice in a way that uh, most of the time will get you something useful in the end that will actually have an impact on the business? Um, it's not uh, the kind of process that you do uh, step by step by step and at the end you get this result. It's more of a, a set of uh, ways of doing things that allow you to get the most value for the time you put into your data. 
And the meat of the talk will be on this corporate brand reputation analysis. It's uh, one of the applications we did in the space. Um, I think we started working on it in 2006. It kind of, in the last couple of years, it was rolled out to global services and IBM. It's become a very successful application in the idea of analyzing social media. And I think it's a really good um, exemplar of the kind of stuff we do in this area. And then finally, I'll kind of give you some of my thoughts of where I think exploratory analytics is going um, in the next several years, the things we're really working on hard right now, and uh, give you some thoughts about where uh, it's all headed. And then the very last slide just kind of gives you pointers to the book, pointers to lots of papers we've written, and hopefully gives you some place to continue uh, looking at this area. So this actually comes from Wikipedia, uh, a great place to kind of get a feel for uh, research out there um, in a general area. And actually I didn't know about this EDA until just I started putting together this talk and looking around at what people had done. And uh, it turns out this is actually 30 or 40 years old, this idea. Came out of statistics. Uh, if you've been in data mining a while, you realize almost everything we've done is actually done many, many years ago in the statistical field. This is no exception. A guy named uh, John Tukey uh, created this idea of exploring as opposed to confirming. And whereas all the approaches and tools he saw there that people were using were all in the confirmatory area, what he realized he was doing was very different. It was more um, figuring out what are the hypotheses that you want to be able to test, not in, in terms of formulating those hypotheses as opposed to actually confirming those hypotheses. I think that's a, that's a really useful concept and one that I think applies exactly to the work that I do. Less formally, I think it's, it's essentially the process of analyzing data to learn what you don't know to ask. Um, you know, a typical uh, statistician will have a certain set of questions. He's going to ask those questions, get some data that answers those questions, and see whether his theory is proven or disproven by the data analytics. Exploratory analytics is totally different that you don't necessarily have any questions. What you have is a lot of data, and you're trying to understand what that data is telling you to ask. So this is, again, this is from, uh, from John Tukey. Um, I thought this was really uh, surprising and also very true. Um, if we need a short suggestion of what exploratory data analysis is, it's these things. It's an attitude, it's a flexibility, and it's graph paper and transparencies. <laughs> and some of you, this, this is kind of a mixture of ages, some of you may not know what transparencies are, so I'll explain that. <laughs> I lived through this age. You actually had to give a presentation. You, the computers didn't connect to the projectors like they, did, they do now, and so you had to actually print your slides onto these uh, transparent films that you would put on overhead projectors. So that's, that's what he's talking about. And what he's really trying to say with that is um, you need a way to communicate via graphics what's going on with the data because it's not something you can understand through a test or through a table or through a number. Um, it's something that the human mind, the way it works to discover these things, has got to see them. And so it needs a way to display the data and communicate it to other people so that they can commit, can understand it and, and um, uh, contribute their thoughts to the process. So um, it's the picture examining eye is the best finder we have for the wholly unanticipated. It's exactly the way I feel about things. So how does this compare to what you're probably used to seeing? The, the confirmatory analysis, I think, is what most people do. And um, I think in your daily practice, if this is the kind of data mining you do, these things will seem like very familiar touch points. Obviously, the more data you have, the better. Why? Because you have something you're trying to prove, and if you just find that data that proves it, you're done. So get more data. I mean, that, that's got to be good, right? Um, Predefined annotations. By that, I mean you've got a set of patterns. You, you want to have those defined ahead of time so you can just throw all your data right at them have those annotations work and then be uh, fire off whenever they see the right data. That's just very efficient, it's, it's sure to work, and you know, again, the more data the better, and you can really make it uh, optimized and very fast. Uh, batch processing, again, 
It's, it's like you figure out what you're going to look for. You got your data over here, throw it at the thing you're looking, that's looking for that stuff, and uh, at the end you'll get your answer, all done. Nothing could be simpler. Uh, supervised learning, the idea of ground truth is very important to this idea because obviously you're confirming something you already know, so you, you've got some examples of that, that, that in your head um, or, or on paper, you found those examples. You can now build a model around them and then find all the other things in the universe that match that idea. And again, you're, you're certain of finding it. There's a lot of certainty built into these approaches. It's very comforting. Um, typically, it's a, a single hierarchical approach. What I mean by that is you start with this view of here's everything, and then here's 10 different um, ontologies that I can, or 10 different classes that I can break things into. And within each of those 10 classes, there are subclasses. And there's really just this one kind of overall ontology that describes the whole universe, and I can make all my data fit into that, and then everything will be classified appropriately. There's only one of those, however. It's kind of like the, the world has to all kind of fit into that, that way of thinking. And precision and recall is, is a great way of kind of uh, evaluating your approach. You, you, you have these things that are right, and you have things that are wrong, and you have things that are you know, true, true positives and, and false negatives, and true uh, uh, negatives, and you can go ahead and, and evaluate every single approach and decide which one is the best approach. And there's always one that's better than all the others, and you can identify it and go forward from there. That's what we're all very familiar with. We see it all the time in, in data mining conferences. So what's exploratory and how is it different? Well, first of all, more data isn't always better in exploratory. In fact, more data is typically a problem. Um, what you want is data that's relevant to the universe you're trying to study. Um, anything that goes beyond that universe is going to be noise instead of signal, and it's going to confuse all the things you're trying to understand. So you want to try to find a data collection that is uh, very topical towards the exact problem you're trying to study and solve. Um, the next thing is, um, instead of having just predefined annotations, you have the features you can discover on the fly based on what's in the data. So the data helps you understand what's there through the features that are uncovered. So the way that you understand uh, the data is through these discovered features. Next, it's dynamic processing. The reason it's dynamic, you can't just do everything in batch, is because there's a certain level of interactivity that's going to take place here. That interactivity involves the human analyst understanding what's been found and making changes to the detectors, to the algorithms, to the approaches to take advantage of what's there that's interesting and ignore the stuff that's there that's not interesting. And that, that, that definition of interesting is critical there. You can't know ahead of time what each analyst is going to find interesting. So the same approach can't work on every single situation, even with the same data. Uh, it really depends on the, the objectives of the analysis. Versus, instead of supervised learning, it's really more of an unsupervised approach. Um, really has to do with uh, discovery, and so approaches like clustering are, are very important. I think it's more than just your typical unsupervised uh, clustering algorithm, though, because um, there's no right answer. You know, you, really, you usually think about clustering as, okay, there really is a set of classes out there. I'm really trying to discover them somehow in the data without the use of a ground truth data set. That's the supervised approach. And the unsupervised says, well, I'll get rid of that ground truth, but I'll still try to understand those as an input, but I'll still try to understand those categories that I think are the right categories through my, my unsupervised algorithm. This kind of unsupervised learning doesn't assume that there's a right answer. It assumes that what's useful is actually good. And what's useful, again, may depend on the situation. And so it, it requires a level of interactivity. It requires kind of an open-mindedness that a lot of these uh, other approaches don't always have. And instead of precision and recall, um, we, we talk about interestingness. We talk about utility. And I like to talk about uh, the interesting wrong answer. Just because an answer is wrong doesn't mean it's valueless in a sense that it may point us in a totally new direction that we weren't even thinking about 
when we defined what we thought was interesting in the first place. That's a very good point. And I, I'm gonna, I think, when I think about how I'm sounding here, it, it does sound like I'm a little bit negative towards the confirmatory and real positive towards exploratory. Keep in mind, I'm very prejudiced about this. You know, it's, I do all this all day long over here, and that part I'm doing a lot less of, so I think this is really great, and that's not so interesting. But it's not true. I mean, I, I really understand that the, the algorithms developed by Netflix uh, contest and the other algorithms are really great, and I, I hope we can do more of them. But the difference is, um, in the Netflix contest, you had all this ground truth data. You had all these people who had, you know, ranked these movies and had uh, really, you know, confirmed that those were the good recommendations. Th this kind of exploratory analysis would really be to look for those kind of hidden associations or completely undetectable things that might tell you something about a whole new business opportunity that Netflix never even thought of doing. Um, it's really talking about um, what you're not necessarily looking for as a, uh, a known business, but the things that are out there that are uh, really surprises. Hopefully we'll see some of that and we talk about the examples um, in a moment. Another way to think about this kind of duality here is it's like reductionism versus holism. So reductionism is the idea that I can take the universe, break it into nice pieces, each of those pieces I can break down further, and when eventually I get to points that everything is a, a, a very straightforward equation that I can solve. The trouble with that is each time you do one of those simplifications to look at a smaller and smaller piece of the universe, you're leaving behind something, you're assuming something, you're making things a little bit too simple. And there, there's an overall complexity that you're, you're ignoring for the purpose of making things testable and uh, mathematical. And there's both an advantage and a disadvantage to doing that. And holism tries to look at things differently and say, let's, let's look at the whole picture and let's not leave anything out. Let's let the data kind of tell us what might be going on that we're not thinking about, that we're not expecting. Let's not make too many assumptions going in. And maybe we'll find something we didn't expect at all and come up with a whole new kind of hypothesis to test. And as Aristotle said, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Um, reductionism is great. It can certainly have a lot of power, but you need to keep the, the whole thing in mind. So I'll, I'll, I don't mean to be negative about, um, you know, the, con the confirmatory approach is very valuable, but there are some limitations to it. Um, ground truth. I'm sure those of us who practice data mining a while uh, no, this is always a problem, and it, ground truth tends to be an oversimplification in many ways, because um, what if there are, is one expert, or a very limited number of experts, who you're relying on to label this data, and you're not really sure they represent the world as a whole? Um, you're, you're making a lot of simplifications in uh, the ground truth data in many cases. It only represents the past. It doesn't represent what's going to happen in the future. So there, there's a lot of weaknesses there. As I said before, precision and recall tends to miss the interesting wrong answer. Just because an answer is wrong doesn't make it uninteresting. Um, things are not always all that repeatable in the real world. So whatever you did, uh, learned on a previous set of data may not be all that practical in the new situation when you've got a new analyst, a new business, a new set of problems. That approach may not work so well. Um, when you start to optimize things, um, Whatever your criteria for optimum is, it may not be the same for another situation, another person, another business. Um, they may find your optimum to be useless. And, and overfitting, you know, I see this so often that people take whatever data they have and they'll build the perfect solution for that data. You know, and, and they try, I mean, don't, don't mean they're being irresponsible in their, in their testing and their building of training sets and testing sets and so on. But, it's very difficult to get 
a, a really representative sample of the universe in your data, you're probably going to wind up, you know, overfitting it to a, a great degree. Just recently, to kind of, um, you know, confirm everything I've sort of been saying up, up till now, this, this article came out about a month ago in the Atlantic Magazine titled, Lies, Damn Lies in Medical Science. And I think it's really kind of um, bringing home the importance of this dichotomy between confirmatory and exploratory. The problem is that, as you probably noticed in medical science, a lot of the research articles that we see um, wind up getting overturned over time. We see a study will come out and say, you know, vitamin X. If you take vitamin X, you won't ever get cancer and heart disease will be cured and, you know, all these problems will be solved. And then, you know, five years later, ten years later, someone will go back and relook at the data, maybe add in some more stuff and realize, oops, sorry, we were wrong. <laughs> well, well, how did that happen? Why does it keep happening? Well, this guy, uh, Dr. John Ionides, actually went back and did a very thorough study of all these kind of mistakes that were made, and he kept seeing this pattern over and over again. Researchers were continually making the same mistakes. Their studies were biased. And what they were doing every single time was essentially uh, letting their own desires about the research impact the actual analysis of the data. Their own hypothesis going in was essentially becoming a part of the results they were getting at the other end. And the odds are that in any large set of data, and we know this as data miners, uh, you're going to find some connections, you're going to find some patterns, no matter what, if you look hard enough, and if you've got enough data. So you've got to be very careful about this. And the thing we ought to be aware of is that we can't just point the figure at medical research. This is true across every research discipline. Um, there's always going to be um, forces outside the data, forces outside of the scientific discipline that encourage the researcher to find results that aren't there. And um, it distorts every single field of science. And so, you know, my, my mission in life is to get people to kind of see this, maybe take a step back and look at the data in a different way so that they let the data tell them what is actually going on in the world as opposed to them trying to make the data say what they want it to say. Yes. There's certainly a lot of blame to go around, and reviewers is um, one area where things, I think, have fallen down in, in science, a sense that people don't see that as their main job, and it's not something they spend enough time really validating the papers they read. Um, and then another thing is a lot of these disciplines don't really have kind of this, what I think of as kind of the scientific pope. There is no one who's really in charge. It's just kind of a, um, a societal meme that kind of goes on and on and on and in the same way without really worrying about at some objective level, are we getting better, are we getting worse? No one's really doing this kind of meta-level study to see whether research as a whole is going in the right direction. And that's, that's a problem. Um, not really have a really good uh, you know, fix for that, but it is something that worries me and I think it should worry all of us. So um, what is this I'm sort of talking about at a, at, a, at a high level? I think that every data mining problem is a combination of three main factors, the organization, the analyst, and the data. Um, the organizational attributes that come into play are what are the overall goals of the organization? What, what are they trying to achieve in this, in this uh, engagement? What are some of the limitations of the organization? What don't they know about? What are they uh, sort of unaware of in the world? And what's kind of the underlying uh, vocabulary or set of entities that they reason about all the time? How do they, how do they think about the world and how do they represent uh, those thoughts? Then within the organization, there's the analysts and that person or persons has a set of characteristics as well. They have the knowledge that they've gained through practice over the years. They have their own set of individual biases that have to be taken into account. They have certain algorithms they're comfortable with, certain ways of visualizing the results that they're happy with and tend to use over and over. 
And finally, they have a certain scope of responsibility that may be very limited in terms of what they can do, both in terms of getting data and in terms of making changes in the organization once the results are known. And finally, uh, the data may sit both within the organization and outside of it. Um, it has questionable reliability. It may not cover the space that we really need it for it to cover for the conclusions we want to draw. And its timeliness may be li very limited in terms of predicting the future. So all of this you know, comes together to make the overall picture of what it is you're trying to do with the data. And you really need to be thinking about that every time you go into a new an analytic situation and take it into account throughout the uh, analyst, analytic process. So this next slide is going to cover 10 years of my life. And as such, it's kind of dense and uh, covers a wide scope of things. But I, I want to kind of give you, uh, in as, as succinct a way as possible, sort of a summary of what I've experienced over the past 10 years that's led me um, gradually to this kind of uh, approach and this kind of way of looking at things, just so you'll get a, um, a better understanding of where I'm coming from. So the, the first thing that I, I did, one of the earliest exploratory uh, projects was called the IBM Jam. Uh, I'm sure that means almost nothing to all of you, but it's, it's a special event that IBM holds approximately every year. Sometimes a little more time goes by, sometimes less where we get the entire company together as one big group and we talk about something for three days. <laughs> sounds, sounds pretty weird, but um, of course we're doing our work too. We don't just talk for three days, but it's basically one long discussion that takes place on the internal web um, about one particular topic that there's a big important decision coming up. Um, one of the ones we did uh, recently was $100 million needed to be invested in new innovations and new technologies. Where should we invest it? Um, that was called Innovation Jam. Um, another one, which is one of the first ones I did, was called uh, Values Jam. And it was actually, the time had come, we decided when the world had changed and the company had changed enough, we needed to look at our values as a company and see if we needed to change those at all and really redefine them. And they wanted, instead of having the, the, the president say, here are our values, go forth and do it, um, let's bubble it up. Let's have the company as a whole kind of participate in the process and see you know, what we think our values ought to be. So how did, how did I get involved in that? Basically, uh, my experience in the past had been in doing text mining for IBM problem tickets. Um, as you probably know, IBM does a lot of help desk and problem tickets are collected for all those help desks. And I had gotten kind of a reputation as someone who could really mine those problem tickets and come up with really good, succinct summaries of what people were saying on these help desk calls. So they thought, hey, could you help us with this problem? We're going to have all these people talking to us and recording their comments on a website. But during that, that jam, we'd like to be able to tell them what everyone's saying, summarize for us what the conversation is about. Otherwise, people will come into this jam and all they'll have is this list of thousands of comments. They won't be able to really participate as a discussion. It'll just be kind of random thoughts of 10,000 people. So I thought, well, okay, I can do that. So I, I went into kind of the jam room and all these comments were coming in and I, and I was running my software and um, what I was used to doing is sort of spending like a day with the data kind of doing lots of different clusterings and looking at all the individual clusters and coming up with what those clusters meant and describing that. Here, they wanted me to do a report every hour on all this data, come up with a new summary of what were the changes, how is the conversation evolving. So I did this for three days straight, almost 24-7. By the end of it, I was a total wreck. And I realized I really needed to rethink my whole process of how I was doing this and come up with much more automatic ways to, to do it without really having to read so much content. Um, and so that was, in a way, kind of the birth of a lot of the techniques I developed came out of that really hard experience. And eventually, by the time we were doing these, these last set of jams here, even though the jams were getting bigger and, and more uh, people were getting involved and more data was coming in all the time, it was actually much, much easier 
for me to do it and eventually for other people to actually do that, that role of actually analyzing the jam and coming up with the top you know, themes that were being discussed over time. Yes, there were three values, and hopefully I can remember them. Um, first is uh, innovation for ourselves and for the world. And I thought that was a really good one because it kind of captured the spirit of all the comments that talked about how important it was to innovate, but not just for making money, but also to innovate to really change the world in a positive way. And I think that, that, that particular one really captured a lot of uh, the comments around that. Um, let's see if I have, ah, I wrote them down. Dedication to every client's success, and that really captured uh, a lot of the ones that uh, talked about um, the client and how important and critical it was to IBM in the past to be a company that really focused on helping the client to succeed, not just on making money off the client. And so innovation, and what was the last one? Trust and personal responsibility in all relationships. This captured a lot of different ideas that came in about um, letting the individual have a level of control over their job that was commensurate with the responsibility they took towards doing that job. It wasn't that everyone just do their own thing, um, but everyone do the thing that you know, is just the right level towards the amount of responsibility they have and keeping that trust so that you're not constantly looking over to everyone's shoulder, everyone's being tied down with lots of bureaucracy and, and um, restrictions on their job. So you know, I, I do think I've done a lot over the years, a lot of different analyses. That's one of my favorites. And certainly to have been a part of the analytics that eventually define the values for an entire company that still exists today well, was something that was very gratifying. You've already seen a little preview of the rest of the slide, but going on now. Um, the next area was a system we did called Business Insights Workbench. It was to take the straightforward text mining we'd done in Help Desk and in the Jams and really apply it in a more general tool that could take data from anywhere in the organization, not just text, but structure, text, anything in a data warehouse, basically and apply these analyt exploratory analytic techniques to it. And we came up with, with three basic uh, stages, which we called explore, understand, and analyze. And that was really kind of the birth of this idea of a, a general process for doing exploratory analytics. Um, the explore phase was giving you all sorts of tools that would let you do search and query and set operations to create that universe of data that I talked about that's relevant to the problem you're trying to solve. The understand phase was doing uh, clustering and classification, uh, visualization, statistics to help you understand exactly what that data had in it so you could better uh, make decisions about it. And then the analyze phase was to take what you did learn from understanding, the classes that you created via clustering and taxonomy generation, and look for the connections, the underlying statistics that would tell you there's something going on between these two you didn't know about before, and then understand that connection through for looking at examples and so on. So that basic process really turned out to be, um, it really was a workbench in the sense that you could go to almost any data, plug the software in, work with it for a few hours, and get some insight into really what was going on underneath the covers with that data. It was a very flexible tool. It could we handled hundreds of different kinds of problems and hundreds of different domains with it. By the end of the day, there was really only about three or four people who used it. <laughs> it was that kind of tool that was so powerful and so flexible, it was almost impossible to train people to do it. And if you didn't do it like every day, at least every week, you spent some time with it, you quickly forgot how to use it and really weren't able to you know, make it scale to lots and lots of people doing it lots and lots of ways. So, it was both a great success and a total failure. The next big project was COBRA, and that's the one I'm going to talk about uh, mostly today. Um, this is a tool for doing social media analytics on the web, and I won't tell you much more about it because I am going to spend most of the rest of the talk on it. And the final tool we worked on was, was simple. 
Uh, this is a tool for analyzing uh, patent and research data in particular. It's a, it's a complete warehouse of all this information about technical innovation that you can both search and do analytics on. And we found this to be kind of like taking w, BIW here, boiling it down to a set of very simple processes and letting you know, the ordinary business user, the ordinary searcher, um, people who are really um, doing stuff with this data on a daily basis, have them have the power to do what I was doing with the more complicated tools. So basically, to kind of give you a uh, feel for these projects, we kind of have been increasing our business impact over time with each of these uh, as years have gone by. And Simple is really a very recent project, so its numbers aren't, aren't up to the level yet of, of COBRA, but we think it's going to go way beyond COBRA eventually. And our total impact, we had this calculated just very recently as $124 million for all these projects together. And that, that allowed us to win an IBM, what's called an uh, um, outstanding accomplishment. Anything more than $100 million of a research project is considered to reach that level of outstanding. There's even a level above that where you reach a billion. And we're not up to that level yet, but no, I think we might make it someday. So that's just to give you a feel. That's 10 years of work right there on that slide. And it's really been uh, a team of, um, started out with maybe four or five people. Now we have about 12 people. And it's just been gradually um, you know, increasing our expertise, increasing our, our breadth, increasing our ability to look at many different kinds of data, and our ability to find ways to communicate what we learn to a user community. Yes? Um, we didn't really total that up. It, that, that number is for IBM's business impact, and so it's a, a combination of many things. It can be revenue, it can be cost avoidance, uh, it can be, you know, when, when we go in and open the door to help sell other software and hardware, that's part of it as well. So um, we never actually went in and said, um, for every single customer that worked with us, how much money did they save with our product? Doesn't. It's hard to get those numbers, to be honest. To be, I wouldn't really trust them anyway. How is any of that calculated, though, especially for the jam technology? We're, we're, as a company, we're very good about putting numbers on things. I'm not sure uh, anyone's quite as good as IBM at, at numbering things. And um, what has to happen for a project like that is someone at a high enough level, a vice president or above, has to sign off and say yes this really saved this much money, and you have to be sure that it's not double counting with any other project, and then you sort of document it. These are, for the most part, um, what we call assets, research assets that are used by consultants and services folks on engagements. So, Yes, we do. So as part of that service engagement, software will be left behind. And in some cases, we actually have web services that people employ as part of their own um, offerings. Absolutely, we do that as well. And um, a lot of this stuff, while it doesn't become products, it inspires products. So Cognos does have a set of products coming out in the social media space, which are really, I would say they're not taking this and implementing it, but they're, in, they're inspired by it, like the same way that a book might inspire a movie. It's kind of that kind of uh, borrowing of ideas. So over these 10 years, I, I've realized that there's kind of a set of uh, things that I do every time I have a new problem in the, in the data space. And I started to document those and recently wrote a paper that tried to kind of formalize this as a real process that anyone could do on any new data set. And so this process, I decided to give it an acronym and it reminded me somehow of this algebraic operations idea where you remember you have, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, parentheses, exponent, multiply, divide, add, subtract. I don't know where that kind of popped into my head, but it was kind of like you have to do this first or else that operation will give you the wrong answer. It was that kind of thing in my mind. So 
that's what I tried to map it to. Sometimes it's a little bit strained, but I think it, it kind of works. So the first step uh, corresponds to parentheses. You have to localize the data first. And the parentheses, I think of that as um, drawing a parentheses in the text around the thing that's interesting to you. That's why I think of it as a parentheses. So it's both, um, and by the way, a lot of what I do is textual in nature. I realize I should have mentioned that up front. I do mostly in my analysis is unstructured data. So I think about things from the text perspective. So the first thing to localize is to select the documents that are relevant. But it's also true that not all of the document is interesting, depending on what problem you're trying to solve. So you need a way to both think about the document set as a collection and also within each document what paragraph or what sentence or what, um, what component of the document is actually going to be relevant to your study. So that's the localization aspect, the parentheses. Once you collect your initial set, you'll almost always find that it's part signal and part noise. If there's any way at all that you can go in and explore that data first and remove the noise and keep the signal, do that first because that's going to really make your analysis so much more powerful. You may have to come back to this step as you get deeper into the steps. You may find uh, what you thought was signal actually turned out to be noise, so go back and expunge it later. So that's the exponent. Multiplication. Um, this actually is about um, what I call multiple feature spaces. Feature spaces are the things that each document has, each element has that describe how we want to reason about it. So it's all the different things we collect about each individual data element. Um, in text mining, typically it's the words, it's the phrases, it's that kind of bag of words representation. I think of this as being multiple because there's often not just one way you can do it. You can often find features in many different uh, approaches. You can also use dictionaries. You can use um, annotations. There's all different ways you can collect information about text, and there's no reason you should limit yourself to just one approach. I also think about it as multiple because it means that every document can have as many features as you want. So it's, it's like many different ways of describing the same entity. Then divide is divide and conquer. And this, is, I think, is a step that's missed so often in text mining, and I, I don't know why it's not used so often, but it's the most powerful way to explore text. The idea is that um, if, you, if you're given a collection of thousands of things, um, it's almost impossible to get your head around that all at once. But if you can break that into components where each component is manageable and each component is homogeneous, then it's pretty easy to understand a fairly short list of things. And so this divide and conquer approach is about building taxonomies that break the data up. But it's doing it in a way that's going to be useful to you for your analysis purposes. The add is the add connection. So once you've got your taxonomies, you've got these groups of things that break the data up, you need to find connections across those different groups. And those connections are what often adds the insight. And then finally, the subtract is the uninteresting material. Once you've found a connection, um, you don't want to have to look at all the different examples of that connection. You want to find a way to prioritize and remove the stuff that's not really telling you anything new and really focus on the stuff that's, that's interesting. So it's just like algebra, really. So uh, a little bit about some of the techniques that we've, uh, we've designed in these areas. For localization, it's usually about search and query. I've also got a technique called proximal search I'll describe in the next slide, which is really kind of an advanced way of doing search. Uh, snippets are important. Like I said before, the whole document is, is not always very relevant, especially if it's long documents. You need ways to break it up into snippets. Uh, set operations like intersect and union are very helpful, as well as sampling. So proximal search, think of this as um, a way to kind of get that initial set going where it's often very difficult. You have an, an idea in mind, you have a subject area, but you don't have a query. <laughs> and the query is the way you're used to getting at data, you know, a, a certain search term. But it's often very difficult uh, to find that, that initial query. So 
what I realized is we can actually have the search engine do the work for us. And the way this works is, I don't know if you can see this text up here at the top, but it's basically this kind of high level description of um, how do I remove bitter taste from food? And there's lots of different genes, expressions involved and different ways this food company was thinking about this technology. And when I read that text, you know, I could think about immediately off the top of my head like 10 queries I'd like to submit to get all the data that might be relevant. But I wouldn't be sure, you know, whether I got the right query or not. Because each query, if I submitted it, might give thousands of results and how many of those thousands are really most relevant. And did I make the query too narrow or too general? I can add words or subtract words. I can do words within a certain phrase or I can, you know, do them in a certain distance. So instead, what I do is actually have the, the proximal search does all that work for me. It takes all that text and breaks it into a set of very long queries that gradually it tries to make more and more general. So the most specific query is like take a whole sentence and put all those words into it as one long proximate query. Um, that usually doesn't return anything. But what you can do is combinatorially start taking words out of that one by one. And if one word taking one word out doesn't work, take two words out. If two words doesn't work, take three words out. Eventually, if, you're, if your sentence is about 10 words in length, you've got about a thousand different ways to do that, two to the 10. So it's, it's doable, basically. If you have enough processing power, you can actually submit a paragraph and, you know, in 10, 15 seconds, get all those queries executed. Then the best queries are the ones that have the fewest results, the ones that are the most specific, that return the stuff that's exactly like your input, hopefully. And so what you can do is collect all those best queries, collect all the patents that get returned by the best queries, and then go in and pull the text out and find the text that matches your original input text the closest using a simple cosine similarity. This, this simple approach is kind of brute force, doing lots of queries, collecting the result, and seeing what works, just, just tends to work really great. We use this in patent areas, so patent engineers in IBM say they want to see if anyone's infringing on our patents. Well, we have 30,000 patents. It's a huge job to try to search that. But you can actually take a product description, throw that into proximal search, and it'll give you like 10 patents that are really, really close to that idea right away. And, and the kind of searching used to do would take days to do this, so now it takes just minutes to actually get a, a set of patents that are very, very on target. So that's, that's an idea of, of, of proximal searching. Um, for the tools and techniques around expunging the noise. Um, these are things like junk filters, boilerplate detectors, eliminating garbage of all kinds. And you can use both supervised and unsupervised methods to do this. Clustering can help you figure out um, what's relevant, what's irrelevant, if you have a, uh, an expert to look at the data. And classifiers can help you to take uh, what you know is good and build a model around that and remove the stuff that you, you know is not good. So intuitive clustering is an algorithm we've come up with that we think works really well in this area. And again, this kind of shows the difference between kind of confirmatory analytics and the exploratory analytics we do. If you're doing confirmatory analytics clustering, you're really looking for a clustering that's going to return you some mathematically um, optimum or close to optimum result. Um, if you're doing exploratory, that's really irrelevant. Why do you care what's optimum? What you're looking for is what's understandable. And so the, the aha moment in intuitive clustering was looking at um, an analyst who was working with a k-means result I created, was going through there and picking out the clusters they really liked, putting those to the side, and running a keyword search that had all the names of those clusters as their taxonomy. I thought, well, that's interesting. It seems like there's certain clusters that they really understand, and those are the valuable ones, and all the others are irrelevant. And so it wasn't the optimum, optimum centroid that was really interesting to them. It was the simple description that was helpful. So instead of trying to build the clusters based on centroids, I basically built the clusters based on the interesting words. And so I built a dictionary of all the terms I found in the data and then used this uh, term, this equation called cohesion to measure which terms were best. And then I basically uh, used a greedy algorithm to find all the best clusters and then just run 
run iteration of k-means at the very end to get the actual taxonomy built where each example went to just a, one of those clusters. And this works beautifully. That's actually the clustering algorithm I use for the jams going forward because it was so simple and it allowed me to really quickly get a sense of what was in the data without having to spend a lot of time on each cluster understanding it. So multiple feature spaces. Um, for this, uh, we use generating words and phrases as kind of our first baseline of features. And then we use um, user input to um, improve the generation of those features. This can be annotations. It can be user-supplied dictionaries. It can also be synonym lists. Um, it can be patterns, regular expression patterns that define certain things that are interesting for features. Um, so we really try to throw in all the kinds of features that might be helpful to us. Um, I'll show you an example from Cobra of user-defined features. Um, these are up on the up at, uh, top here. We have include patterns and exclude patterns written as simple Java regular expressions. And we use those to define a set of words on the left-hand side that are indicative of certain issues that the company thinks are important for understanding their reputation to the brand. Uh, the divide and conquer, um, a set of techniques. Intuitive clustering comes up here as well to generate taxonomies. We also generate taxonomies based on keywords. So if the user has a list of terms they, they think are important, we can add those to the mix as a taxonomy. A time-based taxonomy, often that may take data and divide it into an event that's of interest. What happened before the event? What happened after the event in that continuum? And those three classes are actually often the most interesting. Uh, sentiment analysis, dividing data up in terms of is this a positive event, is it a negative event, is it something where people are saying negative things about your product or, or are they being complimentary? Those are two very interesting classes. Um, iterative, taxonomy, browsing and editing. So when you create these taxonomies, it's often useful to be able to look at them and change them based on what you see in the data. Don't just accept what the clustering gives you. Um, be able to, to filter that out and take out the things that are uninteresting or, or confusing. And to do that, if you're going to edit taxonomies, you need a way to visualize them. Visualization is very important for understanding, for using that visual cortex in the brain to really understand what these taxonomies mean at a deeper level. This visualization is one I'm very, uh, find very useful in most of my work. It's a, it's a scatter plot. And what we do here is we use the centroids of clusters as our axes. So this is the x-axis, the distance between this cluster and that cluster. The y-axis is then the distance to this cluster here. And the basic idea is it's a high dimensional space, but you can flatten it out to a plane using these three points. So three points make a plane no matter how high dimensionality. Then you, you draw a normal line down to the uh, point where it intersects is the actual place you draw it. It's a simple idea, but it's actually a very powerful way to understand relationships between clusters. And what the eye will, will tell you is, you know, look at this point here. It's really, it's kind of an outlier, and you know it's also kind of between the, the oral cluster and the taste mass cluster in our, our food bitter taste uh, taxonomy. So the eye can pick these things out where it's very difficult to find that with simple math. Finally, there, an add connections allows you to take the taxonomies you've generated and find ways to understand what's interesting about them. The co-occurrence table is a, a popular technique to look at two taxonomies at once. Uh, trending lets you look at time over taxonomies. Uh, dictionary analysis lets you take uh, taxonomies and look at them across all the different uh, text content you have at a deep level. Um, industry landscapes lets you look at the entire field of uh, an industry looking at companies across the different taxonomies. And network relationships are a good way to look at uh, connections across many individuals or people in a, in a network of some kind. So landscape analysis, the way we use co-occurrence tables here is um, take a taxonomy, in this case diseases on the left hand side, take an industry taxonomy, so these are companies across the top. Individual cells are the patents. How many patents does each company have addressing each of these diseases? This is obviously a, a drug industry taxonomy. We then color the cells by where there's an interesting co-occurrence. So here we're saying that for Amgen, 
these 26 patents, it's colored pink because there's some kind of affinity there. So we use a chi-square test to indicate, is this a likely thing to have happen, 24 patents by, for this company and this disease? Or given the size of the company's portfolio and the size of the disease, is that really very unlikely? So the, the deeper the color, the red color is the most significant. Pink is kind of significant, but not so much. And yellow is kind of improbable, but not significant. So what you'll notice here visually is something kind of leaps out at you. Genentech has significant areas where no one else has significance. So what they've done, they've kind of developed this patent strategy that says, we'll create patents addressing diseases that none of the other companies are working in. And so when those patents come to fruition, fruition as drugs, we'll have this market all to ourselves. We'll have cornered the market. So that, that, as, an, as a drug company, it's something you, you really want to be aware of you know, how your competition is really approaching the patent landscape. Yes? A lot of businesses follow that Exactly. And the drug industry is very competitive that way. And that's really been one of our top customers in the patent analytics field because of that very reason. Um, tools and techniques attraction. So this gets to the point of once you've found that connection, that uh, interesting area of overlap, you want to start looking at some examples that really confirm it. You don't want to just assume there's something going on without actually looking at the actual patents or, or documents underneath the, underneath the covers. So most typical sorting is a way to decide what documents are you going to look at. Are you just going to look at random documents in that, in that co-occurrence? Or should you look at things that are most like all the others in the set? This will help you really make sure that what you're looking at is representative. Um, value estimation. If there are certain metrics you can use that indicate value in some way, you can look at the more valuable patents first. Um, modeling. If there's some way you can model what it means to be a valuable patent, that's really uh, extremely important. And prediction. If you can use uh, prediction to tell you uh, what's going to be valuable in the future, that's, that's extremely valuable. So patent value estimation is a, a technique we use um, to kind of model what the lawyers told us was the way they looked at the world. They said that when they're looking at a portfolio and trying to decide what to sell or license, they try to find something that introduced a new buzzword technology, maybe something that introduced a web browser to the world or something that introduced you know, voice over IP. If they used that term before any other patent used that term, that's really valuable. So what we did, we basically codified that by looking at all the different words and phrases, uh, up to three, three words in length that were occurring in the claim section of patents, and figuring out um, when did it first occur. Did it, it, was this patent the first time that occurred? Or were there other patents that mentioned it earlier? And if so, how much earlier? So this little bar chart tries to indicate this is like the first usage of this term. This is an early usage. This is not so early, and, and so on. So you basically get a feel for every single patent. How valuable is it by the new technologies introduced? And then it tells you why it's valuable. What is this technology that was introduced, and, and what's the big deal? So that a, a, a patent engineer going to license it can really give a story about why this patent is important and what it's really uh, patenting which if you've ever read patents, isn't always that easy. OK, how much are we doing on time? I don't want to go over too much. So, so COBRA is really what I wanted to kind of focus on as our, our key application area. As I said, this one, we started 2006 or so. We began working with a company called Mars, the one that does the candy, uh, Snickers and M&Ms, the Milky Way are a few of its products. And they came to us with this problem. Um, they used to be able to use clipping services to kind of track what was going on with their brands as far as news and, and is issues that might cause people to view their brands in a negative light. But they were finding more and more that um, most of the stuff that was interesting out there was happening on the web. And that was uh, a difficulty for them to try to track that. They had tried using various keyword services that would give them all the 
data that mentioned Milky Way and Snickers, but you can imagine how messy that was. Um, imagine all the, all the stuff that mentioned Snickers every day on the web, and you could uh, imagine what kind of junk they were trying to search through to find anything useful. So what they asked us to do was use our text mining technology, our exploratory text mining, to see if we could come up with ways to really um, boil that ocean down into something that was comprehensible by an analyst to, to make sense of. And so we built the COBRA system to do that, and we fielded it, um, and like a couple of months later, they came back to us and said, you know, this system's already paid for itself with the one thing we found. There was this... Um, new ingredient they'd introduced into one of their chocolate products called Renette or Rene, and it was um, something that came out of cow stomachs. And they suddenly noticed this spike in the vegetarian community where they were all upset about something. And they, they looked in Cobra and found that what was going on was a discussion was taking place about the fact that this candy was no longer vegetarian. Um, it, we're going to have to stop. We're going to cause a big boycott against all your products. We're going to really do something that's going to, you know, make a big negative publicity about this particular candy. And so they found the key influencers, the people who were really the leaders in this area, had discussions with them and decided as a company they were going to take that ingredient out of the chocolate. And they did that, made a big publicity thing about it, and really actually got positive publicity of what something that could have been very negative for them. So they, they told us that all the money they'd spent with us to develop this product was paid for with that one issue. So how does COBRA work? It actually came out of a very simple idea, which is the power of independent rules. So think about it this way. It, it, there's a mathematics behind this, but actually the mathematics is not very intuitive and actually doesn't really tell you very much. But if you think about it as bubbles, it makes perfect sense. If, if each of these bubbles represents um, a particular query that you're doing, and this is the actual data you want, um, depending on how different the queries are, if each of these queries represents a part of that data, it's an approximation of it, any one of these queries is going to have potentially very high recall, very low precision. The reason is it's kind of, it's kind of drawing a big bubble around an area and getting most of it, but you know, it's missing, if you're in any, any one place in it, may be you know, off the mark. So, you're missing as far as precision, but overall your recall is good. What's interesting is you can, and that's kind of the problem with individual queries about brands in the Mars case. Any one of them will get lots of relevant data, but if you start reading through it, it's mostly garbage. So the trick is to have a set of other queries that you can add to that, so that when you combine the two together, even though the two of them have very low precision, two of them together have much, much, much higher precision. But that only works if these two bubbles are not on top of each other, if they're as disjoint as possible. And that's the independence idea. So basically, uh, that's what COBRA does. It, it develops a set of independent business queries where you have one set of queries that are talking about one thing, another set of queries that are talking about something totally unrelated. Put the two together, and you suddenly have queries that are right on target. So the overall architecture of COBRA is pretty simple. It looks kind of complicated, but really it's crawlers over here that are gathering all the different kinds of data from all the sources. Um, most of these are, are focused on social media. You can also use internal sources, like you have an 800 number that people call into Mars and they complain about a product. We can add that data there too. That all gets converted to XML and then it's all loaded into a data warehouse where a set of extractions and transformations are done that are also saved in the data warehouse. Then there's a web-based GUI that actually does all the analytics and takes the stuff that's in the warehouse and displays it in graphs and charts and reports that are um, hopefully intuitive. So this is a back-end process where uh, one analyst, kind of the, the expert, will kind of set up these queries that will go against the data sources to collect the data. Um, in addition, they can set up uh, a set of models. Oops, I should use this instead. And those models uh, can be built overnight and indexed. So you, you not only have the database, but you also have an index that you can use to do the uh, queries. The models are, are set up ahead of time as well. 
and they really define what the brands are for the company uh, and any other issues that they're interested in. So you could have like key players, might be the corporate officers, um, you might have competitors stuff, so you might have the competitor companies and their brands. All that's usually very helpful. Then there's a set of orthogonal things. Do you see the orthogonal ones? No. Orthogonal things which are um, kind of the independent models. Uh, things like, um, in, the, in the case of Mars, you're looking at like uh, child advertising, uh, legal issues, diabetes, poison, obesity, salmonella, all the things that they know uh, if these issues come up, you know, that's, that's a key problem for them. Um, and then you use uh, a generate utility to overnight do uh, the analytics on the data, build the model, so in the next morning when they come in, uh, all those things are ready to go in the front end. The kinds of analysis we do, you start with a dashboard, look at the data as a whole, try to understand what are the major components, um, how often these components are occurring, um, and again, you've got taxonomies here. So this, this taxonomy is about source, message boards, blogs, Twitter. Uh, this taxonomy is about the brands. And this taxonomy is about the hot words, the, the hot issues. And so that's a way of sort of understanding what's happening. And then the, when, the, when that stuff is happening is the trend charts down below. And you can zoom in on those and kind of, you know, see when there's something interesting, a spike. You can zoom in on that and see the actual text with, with keywords highlighted and a link that takes you back into the discussion if you want to see the whole thing in context. So there's a set of taxonomies we develop uh, using text clustering as well as the um, different taxonomies that the user gives us. So you can break up the data many different ways, and the co-occurrence table is available to let you see when there are connections between those different categories. This can often help you with the idea of discovery, where you may not know all the different, you know, hot words that are of interest to you or that people are talking about on the web. You may not know the vocabulary that people use on the web. So these, these kinds of analytics can help you discover where there's correlations, but say, between your brand and other people's brands that are different. So relationships tables uh, really take you to, um, here's a taxonomy on this side, and then on this side you'll see all the different things that are related to it. Here you can see uh, sentiment, for instance. We have positive sentiment around customer service for this particular product. Co-occurrence tables really help us to see where there's significant uh, areas. In this case, we're looking at um, a text clustering uh, versus a set of uh, user-defined categories. So where there might be interesting areas they, they didn't know about for any of these different um, acquisition things, we see different uh, clusters that can be defined with it. Sentiment analysis. So. Um, the way we do sentiment, it's a very statistical process. What we do is we have a dictionary of all the positive words and all the negative words in the English language. And this is fairly common. You can find these dictionaries pretty easily nowadays. And then what we do is we go into WordNet and find the definition of each of these words. And given the number of positive and negative words in the definition, we come up with a relative score or how positive or how negative that, that word is. Um, then using uh, statistics, we take each of the snippets around the, the product or um, the brand and look for uh, the content of that snippet in terms of how many positive, how many negative words it has and how, um, what score each of those words has. Was it a very positive word, less positive word? Add up that score, divide by the sort of length of the snippet to normalize. And that kind of gives you the overall positiveness or negativeness of the snippet. Then you basically look at all the snippets as a continuum and divide it into quintiles. The most positive is labeled positive, the most negative is labeled negative. The 60% in the between is labeled neutral. We do that because um, every domain is different and you shouldn't assume that um, the same kind of 
relative arbitrary score for positive or negative will work in every domain. What you want is kind of a distinction made between the most positive stuff and the most negative stuff in any given area. And so this will help you to find that, that sort of disjunction between the most positive and the most negative uh, concepts. Yeah, well that's, the one, that's the one NLP thing we do, which is basically we look for the negative words like not or nor or, or no, and we um, look for things that happen right after that, and we discount it if it's uh, got a negative in front of it. For the most part, you know, we don't do things like sarcasm and sort of um, things that you would only know by the context. And um, it, it works as long as you have enough data, as long as you have sufficient examples in a given set. Um, it will find uh, the interesting correlations. It doesn't work if you're saying any one particular snippet you're looking at, um, the ranking it comes up with might not agree with the ranking you would give that particular snippet. Um, but to be honest, I've never seen a snippet uh, uh, calculator that can really do that any better than, as, as well as a human could. Five and one. <laughs> it's very evenly distributed by the by the uh, algorithm we're using, but we're not using a ground truth algorithm. We're not using actual ratings. We're, we're basically using um, words and their content. Uh, typically, yes, uh, especially on the web. There a lot of stuff, people are complaining about the products and uh, saying very negative things. I wouldn't say there's any lack of negative comments, but it's not the same kind of thing you're talking about where you're, you're rating a book or you're rating a movie. It's no, you're complaining about stuff. People complain on the web all the time. Yes? What, what about a word that has um, opposite, an opposite meaning? Like, for example, I might give you an uh, iPod and say, the iPod is a cool device, but I am very cool towards AT&T, for example. The word cool, then, is bad in one context, good in the other context. Or another example, I might say that something is awfully pretty, and then the next Yeah, I'll, I'll say this about that, I mean, a couple of things. One is, it differs by domain, and I'll give the example that we, one of the earliest ones we found in the healthcare domain, the very word care, um, normally that's a positive word, but in the healthcare domain it, it's not positive at all, it's just kind of a neutral word, it's just the word you use to describe the domain. So we realized, first of all, we had to give a transparency to the user about the dictionary itself, and so the users can go in and First of all, they can see what's causing the rating. I don't know if I have a slide about this, but uh, maybe not. But it actually shows you when you click through here, the snippets themselves and the individual words are highlighted green and red as far as which are positive and which are negative. So you can quickly, as a domain expert, realize, oh, that word care, I need to take that out of my, my positive dictionary because it's going to mess me up. Um, the second thing is what you're saying is still going to be true for awfully. <laughs> and I don't know of a really good way to fix that. I'm not going to try. What I'm going to do is say, you need to look for significant relationships between negative affinity and your brand. And if you have enough data, it's probably going to be right, even if I miss the pretty awful one. And so, and then finally, when you get all done, and all of a sudden done, you need to do the confirmation. This is just a hypothesis at this point. The confirmation is when you click on this box, and look at the six examples and see what they're saying. And if they're saying pretty awful when you thought they meant awful, 
or is that the minute good or whatever, then, you know, the human is the ultimate judge of this. Uh, the next analytic is this idea of key influencer. Um, who are the people who are doing the talking? And who are the people who are being pointed to by the people doing the talking? And those are the two things most uh, of our customers wanted to know about. It's sort of uh, people who are generating the content and the people who are looked up to by those generating the content. So we can do this at several different levels. You can do it at the, the site level, like this one is showing. You can do it at uh, the page level. Or you can do it somewhere in between, which is like the, the author of the blog or, or the poster in the message board. Finally, there's this, what we call the alerts tab. And this is really the tab that Mars most wanted. And it, it's kind of a, think of it as like a table of contents to the blog space. Uh, basically, it's taking all the concepts you thought were important, starting with the company and its brands, going down through uh, the key concepts, looking at it through the hot words, and then finally the different sources. And by looking at it from this point, you can say, ooh, there's a big number here, something going on. Oh, another big number there. Or this is really something lost. I've got to find out about that because that's really important to my vice president and he's really concerned about that. So, you know, you have a way to, in one table, kind of see everything that's happening. And without reading blog after blog after blog, in just a few minutes, you get a sense of the whole space of your brands and, and the social media space together. So here, I think, is a sentiment one. I think, I don't know if you can see the highlighting, though. Oh, that doesn't look like it has highlighting in this one. It does uh, give you a sentiment score that you can sort by, so you can bring to the top the positive or the negative or the neutral by sorting. So here we basically have the uh, ability to click through and see the actual snippet in context, the words that were used to identify the snippet. There's usually uh, one hot word and one um, brand, and then the URL that takes you back to the, the individual thing. So where are we going from here? Um, first of all, what we've noticed is there are certain processes that customers typically want to do with their data, and it's not always the same process for every customer. And we, what we wind up doing is kind of uh, doing a lot of programming and redevelopment for every new customer we come to. So we wanted to come up with potentially what we call recipes, which are analytics that can be customized and then reused in different contexts. And those recipes can be changed subtly to allow you to do different kinds of analytics for different situations. We don't use that kind of search engine in our work. What you're talking about is really a search engine sorting algorithm or a ranking algorithm, like what Google uses. Basically, it's going to put certain things on top. The search engine we use, uh, we basically get all the results. We don't rank them. We just get them all. And then whatever ranking we do is through the analytic processes, like the proximal search one that I mentioned earlier, where you're submitting many different queries and bringing to the top the ones that are best. Or use a value calculation like we did with the patents and bring to the top the patents which are considered most valuable because of the buzzwords they use. So we're not relying on someone else's ranking algorithm to provide the results. Well, certainly, certainly on the web, you will see a lot of spam data. You will see a lot of data that's really meant to fool search engines. It's what it's there for and to get other people drawn to that site. So we have what's called junk filters in our software. What it will look for is English as a spoken language has certain statistical properties. Certain words like and and the and but will occur a certain level of frequency. And typically, these spam filters won't have that regular property. It won't follow those statistics. So it's usually not too hard to spot the stuff that's junk and uh, throw that out. So we have junk filters in COBRA. Um, Goal-directed analytics. The idea here is um, people often don't know what process they want to use, but
but they almost always know what they're trying to get to in the end. They, they, want, they know the end state they want. So we can potentially develop uh, kind of a backward chaining reasoning for analytics, which would say, okay, that's the goal you want. Here's the things I know how to do to take data and get you to that result. Let's just go ahead and, and do one of those things and create a process to go from your data to that result. It might not be the right result at first because the choices I make along the way in that process may be the wrong choices for you, but at least I'll sort of show you a potential process to use and you can go back then and, and edit that process to create what you really want. Um, exploratory analytics on the index. I think proximal search is one example of this, but I think it's a potentially a unmined area, uh, a, a really interesting area for doing more and more kinds of analytics. Instead of working with the data directly, use the index as a stand-in for the data, and you get a lot more efficiency that way. Um, Hadoop is something that's very interesting to us, um, but of course, the hang-up here, the reason it's not easy is because Hadoop isn't always that interactive. It tends to be a batch processing kind of uh, uh, infrastructure. And we, as I've shown, exploratory analytics is very interactive. So we're going to have to find ways to interact more, more uh, directly with Hadoop clusters. Um, modeling. Uh, more and more, customers don't just want to explore. They want to explore towards a particular purpose. And that purpose usually is some kind of prediction of the future. And if you're going to predict the future, you really have to be able to do modeling. And so, whereas before we've kind of been um, satisfied, or customers have been satisfied with just kind of seeing the results you saw in Cobra, where you know these are the different things that people are saying about your product, now they want to know, well, how's that going to affect my sales next month? How's that going to affect my profits? So that's going to require taking other kinds of data, folding it in with the text, coming up with models that kind of do more prediction. Most of what I talked about today is about the unstructured side, that with some structure mixed in, I would like to kind of take more of these techniques and apply it more and more to structured data. And again, that's, that's partly about the modeling as well. Most modeling requires uh, more structured data, so I think that's a, a general trend. Finally, uh, further reading. You saw the book. Uh, that's available on Amazon, and I brought a few copies if you're interested. Um, the recently uh, released journal article. I actually wrote this a couple of years ago. It took a while to get through the journal process. Uh, now it's available at the IBM Journal of Research and Development. It talks about PEMDAS. And then for COBRA, if you're really interested in more on that, there's two papers available. The first paper is kind of the, the high level one, and the second paper is the really mathematical one. So if you know your level of interest, that's where to find that out. Okay, uh, you've been a good audience. Lo ask lots of questions. Uh, any more questions you didn't get a chance to answer? Yes. Sure. He's asking about multi-language, and you know everything I talked about here was sort of English and. Would we do this in other languages and potentially use translation? And the answer to both questions is yes. Um, we have versions of COBRA that work in Spanish and Japanese and other languages are coming. Most of the techniques we use are not really language dependent. The only thing was the sentiment, as you probably saw, is very dictionary oriented. So you pretty much have to translate that dictionary. We use mostly automatic translators to do that. Um, so it's not, not a huge process, but it does require some work. <coughs> We are looking at doing some automatic translation for the jams. So one of the next jams we're going to do is going to be in multi-languages, and we're going to have um, each post translated into all the other languages using an automatic translator. So we'll see how that goes.